All right, we're going to begin. All right, so welcome. Um, so some of you familiar faces, but we have a bunch of unfamiliar faces, so welcome. Um, this is a class on channel stories in the Torah. And for some people who paid my class before, and um, I will just tell you that this, I love to make sheets that go with my classes, but this is my first, I think my first class I, I've maybe ever taught, including all the students I teach like at Baron Academy, where I have did not bring a source sheet because I did think I needed one. Because tonight we're really only going to be using uh, the Humash text with, um, with no, really no commentaries. Okay, so this class I titled um, Yitro and Malki Sedek, Life Coaches of Our Leaders. All right, so before we get started, um, I just want to ask a little bit around the room. Do, does anyone know who Malki Sedek is? Because he's a pretty minor character that we're going to examine. Yes. Anyone else is a no? It's okay, you can't be a no. We're going to read it. <laughs> okay. So we have, we're going to be looking at two characters tonight, but in addition, since they are, as we, as in the title, life coaches for the leaders, we're also going to be looking at two leaders, the leaders being Abraham and Moshe. So what we're going to do is we're going to start, we're going to look at um, Abraham, who connects with Malki Sadek, and we'll see what, what, how, what, the, what their connection is, and we're going to look at that story. Then we're going to look at Yitro, and he links with um, Moshe. So we're going to look at, he has a few different sources we're going to look at. And then we're going to kind of compare and connect the two stories and see what we can learn one story to the other. All right, so we're starting with um, Abraham, and we'll get to Malki Sedek in, in a very few minutes. So just to recap a little bit of what we know about Abraham. Okay, so um can someone tell me what is the first thing we know about Abraham from the Torah from the Bible well he was a friend of God um, Hashem right okay and we start so we'll just we'll skim a little bit and then we'll get to the part where we read the verse first if you open up your um books here your homage right we are looking at chapter 12 of Genesis of Rishi which is on page 69 and aside from a little bit of genealogy, which comes before this, we really don't know anything about Abraham. He comes on our, the scene of the Bible when he is 75, and we have this famous line, God says to Abraham, in Hebrew it is, Lech lecha, me'artzecha, u'mimoladetcha, u'mibeit avicha el ha'aretz asher aracha. Like, go and leave your native land, your father's house to the land that I'm going to show you. And God promises him two main big promises. One is Zerah, that a great nation will come from him. And the other is Aretz, that that nation will then um, be given what they call land, by right? we know in the future the land of Israel. Um, so Abraham is told you're going to leave your father's house, right? You're going to kind of leave everything behind and you're going to go um, to this new land, to Eretz Nan, and you'll be blessed if you do that. And so on and so forth. And he does, right? He takes his wife, Sarah, and he takes his um, nephew, Lot, and they go, and they go to the lands of Canaan. Okay, so that's, um, so far what happens with Abraham. Then there's a, he gets to this land that God says is going to be so great, and then there's a famine, a very big challenge. So he goes down to the land of Egypt, where he then says to his wife, Sarah, hey, this land is like kind of sketchy here, right? I'm a little nervous about the people here. So instead of saying you're my wife, say you're my sister, because he's concerned that maybe they will see Sarah and she's beautiful and they will kill him to take Sarah for themselves. Meaning they won't just, no one will take a married woman, but they'll kill the husband so then she is unmarried. So mm -hmm. they have a little interaction there with the king and then they leave Egypt with a lot of wealth. Then Abraham's nephew Lot, they're both so wealthy and they start kind of to argue about there's not enough land for the two of them. So Abraham says, okay, let's, let's separate a little bit. But Lot doesn't separate a little bit. He separates a lot. And he goes to live in a totally different place um, called Still. And that's kind of where we are, where we're going to now read the Sukim like inside. Well, the verse is inside. So now we're going to start on, now skip to page 77. This is chapter 14. 
and this chapter is often titled the war of the four kings and the five kings you can imagine why just like because of what it, there's four kings and are having a war against five kings and you see that in the first verse there right we have Amraphel, Arioch, Kadar Omer, Tidal, that's four, and they made war on Darav Sohm, Yershav Kamara, Shinab Radma, Shemeber, and the king of Bela. And that's five. So we don't need to know any of the names exactly, but the only one that's important, I think, for us here is going to be King Bera of Stone. So if you were reading through the chapters, you would be like, ah, Stone, I remember that place because that's where Abraham's nephew Lot went to live. So, uh, and now, you know, his, the, that city, that nation of stone is in this war. Okay, now we're gonna skip a little bit. So they're having a war. Now let's skip to page 79, verse 13. So it's interesting also that in the Kumash, right, the Torah, which is about Abraham and Abraham's, um, you know, his travels, his relationship with God, all of a sudden we have this like, chapter about a, a foreign war, right? It has nothing to do, at first we might say, with Adam at all. Okay, these four nations are fighting against these five nations and whatever, Adam's like living his life, I am, you know, like minding his own business, but we'll see now in these verses that it's going to be relevant to him. Okay, so we are now in verse 13, chapter 14 on page 79. A fugitive brought the news to Abram the Hebrew, who was dwelling at the turbans of Mamre the Amorite, kinsman of Eshbel and Abner. Okay, so a fugitive comes. It's also interesting, you'll always see in the Tanakh, whenever there's a war, there's always someone who escapes. Even if they say everyone was killed, there's always this one guy who like runs off to tell the story. So here, not that everyone's killed here, but this the fugitive escapes. He comes and he says, he tells Abraham, when Abram heard that his kinsmen had been taken captive, he mustered his retainers, born into his household, numbering 318, and went in pursuit as far as Dan. So what does the fugitive come to tell Abram? That his nephew Lot, remember he's living in Stone, and in this war, he has been taken captive. Which also, we know this war, that the, the Stone and their allies, they are, they are losing this war. So what does Abram do? He takes 318 men, not, not so many for a big war of four kings, right? Five versus five kings. And he's gonna get involved now with his 380 men. At night, he and his servants deployed against them and defeated them. And he pursued them as far as Kova, which is north of Damascus. He brought back all the possessions. He also brought back his kinsman Lot and his possessions and the women and the rest of the people. So Abram almost single-handedly with his like merry band of 318 people defeats all those nations, right? And now he has saved Lot and he's also saved, you know, the rest of, of the, the people of Stone. Okay, when he returns, we're on verse 17 now. When he returned from defeating Kadar Omer and the kings with him, the king of Sodom came out to meet him in the valley of Sheba, which is the valley of the king. So you would imagine, right? You are the king of stone. Avram has just kind of saved the day. And now you're coming out to greet him. So if you have not read ahead yet, what do you expect maybe the king of stone is going to do, to say? Offer him a reward, maybe? Right, maybe offer Avram a reward. Or he will say, Wow, thank, thank you. you. <laughs> right, thank you. That was amazing, right? Um, okay, so we're waiting to see, right? Here we are, we're reading it. What is the King of Stone going to do? Going to say, is he going to give him something? Is he going to say something very beautiful and like, you know, like, like thankful? And yet, what do we see? So that was verse 17. Here's the, um, the King of Stone coming out to meet Avram. And then we have these few verses. 18, 19, and 20. And they're very, I would say, kind of mysterious. Like we have this other character now, mm -hmm. King Malki mm -hmm. and he's just going to kind of show up, right? It's a little bit of a, I wouldn't say it's a tangent because it's still in the story, but it's a little bit of like an interruption. Like we're waiting, what's the King of Stone going to do? And yet here we have King Malki Tzedek, who we're going to, who is going to be our little focus night, even though, our focus night, even though he has very few verses about it. 
All right, here we go. And King Malki Tzedek of, in Hebrew it's Shalem, um, here it's Salem, it says, brought out bread and wine. He was a priest of God most high. Okay, so what do we know about this? King? He's like a king, but he's also a priest. Mm -hmm. He's from this place, Shalem. Um, not sure where that is, right? It's not in any of the places mentioned in the war that we, you know, people we go back and we check. It's not any of the places mentioned in the beginning when they talk about this war of the four kings and the five kings. But he comes out and he brings bread and wine, left on the iron. And he is, right, a priest of El, El Elyon, translated as your God Most High, which also, we're not sure what that means. Does it mean God, like Abraham's God, like the God, like our God, or does it mean a different God? Unclear, but we have a little bit of information. He's a king, he's a priest, and he's bringing out wine and bread. And he blesses him, meaning Abraham, and he says, blessed be Abraham of God Most High, creator of heaven and earth, and blessed be God most high, who has delivered your foes into your hand. So he says this beautiful blessing to Avram. And we think now, right, that El Elyon sounds like God, right? Blessed be Avram of God most high, who is the creator of heaven and earth. And blessed be God, who has delivered your foes into your hand. Which is also, he's saying, wow, blessed be God, because Avram, you won this war because God helped you. Like God delivered your enemies into your hands. And then Abraham gave him a tenth of everything. A tenth, we don't even know what is back in Hebrew, it says Nicole, like a tenth of what, maybe the spoils. He, he gave him something in, it seems like, um, in return. He gave him a tenth. Then we kind of like zoom back to the scene. So interrupting the king of stone was coming. Here comes Malki Tzedek, says this beautiful thing to Abraham and gives him uh, bread and wine. And now we go back to the king of stone. The king of stone says to Abraham, give me the persons and take the possessions for yourself. Which means, right, the people that were captured, mm -hmm. give me them, but you can keep the spoils. But Abraham said to the king of Sodom, I swear to the God, I swear to the Lord, God most high, creator of heaven and earth, I will take so much as a, I will not take so much as a thread on a sandal strap, and I won't even take the string from your shoe of what is yours. I will not take any little bit of what is yours. You shall not say it is I who made Abraham rich. For me, nothing, but what my servants have used up as for the share of the men who went with me, Anir, Eshkel, and Mamre, let them take their share. So what is Abraham? So let's, let's explore this, this exchange. The king of stone says, give me the people and you can take the possessions. Now, what kind of answer would you say Avram has now, or we read Avram has given to the king of stone? First of all, is he saying yes, I'll, yes or no? Yes or no? He's saying no. Uh, uh, right, no. What kind of no is it? It's you can't find me. Right, it's like, it's a kind of mean, not I'll say mean, like a, a very, like, I don't like you king of stone, no. Right, like the, right, but all, and he's saying, I don't want to take anything from you because I don't want you to say, I'm the one who made Avram rich and I don't want you and I to have any kind of like alliance or connection or anything like that. But at the end he says, but you know, for my, for the people who are with me, like they, I want to take some stuff for them because kind of like, you know, to pay them or, you know, to give them some kind of reward for coming with me. But he will not take anything. Okay. So this is what we have here of Avram. Now, let's try to answer the question of what is, okay, now I don't think we can answer the question. I mean, if we went into commentaries, we could maybe answer the question, who was Malki Tzedek and, you know, where does he come from? But we really have no information about him. But what we can try to figure out, I think, is why do we have him here? Why, let's assume it's on purpose, right? That the Torah has purposely stuck in, you know, his coming to Avram and that exchange that he has with Avram in between, right, the, the king of stone who is coming. And then right after he gives, he has his exchange with Avram, the king of stone has his exchange with Avram. What do you think might be the point of it? If you had to like, and I'll, I'll give you a hint of how to maybe think about it, is like how to kind of like compare the two, the two leaders, the, not Avram as leader, but compare, we have a king of stone and we have king of, you know, Malki Tzedek, 
um, of showing. Now to think about that, you have to think about this first. Like, what do we know about stone in general? They weren't very good people. Right, it's a bad place, right? Even today, we still use that term, right? Stone and Gomorrah, right? We, like, it, it's like the worst, it's, it's a terrible place. So the king of stone, you would assume, not the best mm -hmm. guy. And, and if we compare, and that's what many people have suggested, and I think it's a great idea, that Malki Tzedek maybe is stuck in to be a foil, right? To be like, to highlight for us the king of stone, but not the king of stone in a good way, but the king of stone in a negative way. And here, here's, let me read it, let's read it again carefully. Malki Tzedek comes and what is the first, what do we, what do we, what does he do? He gives, right? He gives bread and wine to, um, to Abraham. And then Abraham he, would be indebted to him. And that maybe, although, or, but he doesn't say, hey, I want anything back from you. He just brings it kind of like an offering or like a, or like a, here, like here's for you. Or also just practically speaking, he gives him, you know, it's post war. He gives him like sustenance, right? Like here's some, here's some food because you just fought a war and you're probably really tired and maybe really hungry. So he gives that to him. Now take a look at the King of Stone. If you look in verse 21, right? What is the first thing we, the, the Bible in the verse tells us about the King of Stone? He says, what is the first word out of his mouth? Here, give me, give me, right? So here's a little bit of a juxtaposition. Malkitzedek, what is the first thing? He's giving to Abraham. And the king of Stone is saying, I want something, right? Give me, give me the people and you can take the possession. But it's a very different feel and a very different vibe than um, Malki Tzedek in, in his coming and giving. Then Malki Tzedek, you know, just says this beautiful thing about God. Um, and we see that Abraham, I think maybe takes, takes that, like he has kind of integrated that blessing because he uses the same language. He says to Stone, to the king of Stone in verse 22, I swear to the Lord, God most high, which is that same expression that Malki Tzedek had used. In Hebrew, it's El Elyon. And now he is using that expression. And he's like, I don't like you, king of Stone. Like, yes, I kind of helped you because I was saving my nephew Lot because he was taken captive. But I do not want to be connected with you. I don't want to be aligned with you. So I'm, I'm not going to take anything from you. And it could be, and we'll get back to Malki Tzedek after we look at um, our other character, Yitro. But here in Malki Tzedek, we might say that what is he doing? He's, he's, he's like an unknown, mysterious character, but he comes to show, to highlight, maybe for Abraham, that it is not a good idea to be aligned with the King of Stone, because the King of Stone is not really a good person. But Abraham knows, but the King of Stone is offering him, you know, more wealth. Like, yeah, take, take all the possessions. Okay, so we're gonna we're gonna come back to uh, to them. We'll just keep them like now in the just back. Other of thought. He said he took possession. He wanted the people. You think he would have killed the people? No, they're his people. Oh, it's his meaning people. they're the people that were taken captive, okay. and now he wants them back. Oh, okay. Okay. All right. Now we're gonna talk about Yitro, and then we're gonna kind of put them all together. All right. So Yitro is a more familiar character, right? Mike said it's very small. Most people don't know about him, and it's all. This is the only. Time he's showing up here in in this war of the four kings and the five kings, which a lot of people also it's kind of a, not the, the biggest uh, main story in Brashit. Um, so it's understandable if we don't really know about about Maki Tzedek. Okay, now let's talk about Yitro. Does anyone know anything about Yitro? Yes, anyone else? Okay, if you go, just yeah. All right, okay, great. So let's just let's jump in there. All right, so Yitro comes up a few times. Okay, so we're gonna turn now to Exodus chapter two. Um, okay, page, we're gonna start on page 324. All right, so in so 324. Okay, so we're all familiar, I think, or most people are with the story of Moses. He's born, and then his mom puts him in the little basket. <clears throat> if you've ever seen Prince of Egypt, wonderful animated movie about it. 
um, let's put him in a little basket to save him because Pharaoh, the Pharaoh had decreed that all the baby boys that are born should be thrown into the Nile. So his mom tries, you know, in a kind of a desperate attempt to save him. She puts him in a little basket, puts him in the Nile in the hope that maybe someone will find him and someone will save him. And lo and behold, Pharaoh's daughter finds him and sees him and takes him as and raises him as her own son. And there, and then and this is where we start what we're going to read on page 323, this chapter 2, verse um, 11. Oh, wait, I'm going to read page before, sorry. But it's just one more. So sometime after that, right now Moses, Moses, Moses grows up. When Moses had grown up, he went out to his kinfolk and witnessed their labors. He saw an Egyptian beating a Hebrew, one of his kinsmen. He turned this way and that, and seeing no one about, he struck down the Egyptian and he hit him in the sand. So Moshe goes out when he's grown up and he sees an Egyptian striking one of the slaves. And in this case, um, it says here one of his kinsmen, but there's a lot of discussion over who, who, does, like, who does Moshe feel are his kinsmen at this time? Remember, he's born and he's Jewish, but he's been raised in Pharaoh's home in the palace. So it's unclear um, what he, you know, if he perceives himself as an Egyptian or he perceives himself as, um, as a Hebrew, but he's definitely going out to kind of explore, right? This seems like the first time he's going out and about to really see what's going on out there in Egypt. And um, this is one way to look at it, right? He goes out and what does he see about Egyptian, right? The Egyptian that he, he sees is hitting a slave. And Moshe, of course, you see, does not like that. And when he sees, he looks, he checks this way and that way. And when he sees that no one's no one's watching, he, he strikes down the Egyptian and he kills him because then he hides him in the sand. Then the next day, so we're back in the text now, verse 13, when he goes out the next day, he sees two Hebrews fighting. Right now he's like Jew versus Jew and they're fighting. And he says, why do you strike your fellow? And he retorted, meaning the one who was doing the striking says, who made you chief and ruler over us? Do you mean to kill me like you killed the Egyptian? So then he goes out and he sees two Jews and how do they respond to him? In a pretty mm -hmm. obnoxious, not nice way, right? Who do you think you are telling us what to do? And then they say, and we know that you, you know, and who do you think you are? We know that you killed that Egyptian. So Moshe was frightened and he said, uh-oh, the matter is known. When Paro, when Paro learns of the matter, then he will kill and he will try to kill Moshe and he tries to be like, so Moshe flees and he arrives in the land of Midian. So just to recap, we have Moshe going out. So far he's had two interactions. One, seeing the Egyptian, who he might have identified with, but the Egyptian is, you know, hitting, beating a slave. And Moshe's like, I don't like that. Then he tries, let's say, to, he sees his own, you know, oh, maybe I'm like, let me connect with my Jewish side. And that's not a good interaction either. And then, yes, practically he has to flee because he's afraid for his life. But there is a suggestion that here we have Moshe, if you view it in like a psychological way, trying to figure out his identity. Am I Egyptian? Am I Jewish? Both of those, you know, interactions have been, were terrible for him. And some people suggest like that that's why he flees also, because he is like, I don't want to be, Jewish, I don't want to be Egyptian, you're both terrible, I'm leaving. And he flees to Midian. And here he is in Midian. And this is where we're going to now find Yitro. Okay, verse 16, we're on the top of page 325. Now the priests of Midian had seven daughters. They came to draw water and filled the troughs to water their father's flock. But shepherds came and drove them off. So we already have the daughters, they're trying to water their sheep, but the shepherds are, you know, maybe they want to always be first, you know, they're, they're not letting them go. And here's Moshe again. Whenever he kind of sees some kind of injustice, he rises up. Moses rose to their defense and he watered their flock. When they returned to their father, Reuel, now keep in mind, we say we're talking about Yitro, but he has a bunch of different names. And in this story, he is called Reuel. And he said, how is it that you have come back so soon today, right? Like usually it takes you a long time because probably the shepherd, they have, probably have to wait till the shepherds are probably have left. And they said, an Egyptian rescued us from the shepherds. And why do you think they call Moshe an Egyptian? He was probably dressed as a Right, exactly. He, he probably looked like an Egyptian because remember he, he probably, mm -hmm. you know, like 
looked and his hair and in the movie. Yes, like in the movie. <laughs> an Egyptian rescued us, right? It's in the Ten Commandments or Prince of Egypt. An Egyptian rescued us from the shepherds. He even drew water for us and watered the flock. And then Ruel, who we'll see is also Yitro, he said to his daughters, Where is he then? Why did you leave the man? Ask him in to break bread, right? Tell him to come for dinner. <laughs> so Moshe consented to stay with the man, and he gave Moshe his daughter Tzipora as a wife. And she bore a son whom he named Gershom, for he said, I have been a stranger in a foreign land. Now this naming, right? So he gets married. Um, he, we're not trying to make that. He gets married and uh, you see in the naming of his son, which you often see in the Torah, lots of namings on like the circumstances where they're born. Um, and Moshe says, I'm naming him Gershom. Gershom means a stranger because I have been a stranger in a foreign land. Now this could mean multiple, you know, different things. What do you think one explanation would be? I have been a stranger in a foreign land. Where was Moshe a stranger in a foreign land? Egypt. What, okay, what do you mean? Well, because he wasn't sure who he was. Right. He could be talking about Egypt. I was a stranger there. I wasn't really Egyptian because I'm a Hebrew, right? I wasn't really a Hebrew because I'm not really a slave and I grew up in Paris house and I was like, I, I don't have like an identity. That's what it could mean. It could also mean I'm a stranger here in Midian because like, you know, I'm not a Midianite and it's, it's unclear what it means. But it, what I think we see from his naming is that Moshe does not really feel like he belongs 100% with being Egyptian, being a Hebrew. And I would imagine that um, if God had not called Moshe back with the burning bush to say, you should go back and save the Jewish people, he might have just, you know, lived out his life peacefully as a shepherd in Midian. Okay, now, um, before we move on to the next, now, so we have this guy, Ruel, we'll see him again now, right? He is Moshe's father in the next story, he will be called Yitro. He has a few names. Um, in, in another story, we're gonna look at three. Another story, he's also, he's named Chovav, but all the commentators agree because he's always referred to as Moshe's father-in-law that he's the same person, just with multiple names. So in this story, um, we see that right, Moshe kind of runs off to Midian. And he he the language is, if you look back, right, they leave him at the well. He doesn't ask to go with them. He doesn't say, Oh, can I come to your house? Could I, you know, could I, could I, could you give me some food? He just doesn't. And then Yitro is the one who says, No, bring him home. And then it says in verse 21, Moshe consented to stay with the man. Now I'm pointing that out to you because I think we have to, we're going to view Moshe as someone who really is a little bit like a loner. I think that's partly because how he grew up, right? When you feel like maybe you don't fit in, um, he kind of resigns himself to just being by himself. Like, uh, I'm okay by myself. I don't really fit in anywhere. So I'll just be by myself. When he he consents to stay with Yitro, you see that there's a little bit of a crack there, right? He comes to stay with Yitro, and then he marries Yitro's daughter. So he's now like expanded. Like I won't be alone, but I'll have my own little family, and then I, and then I'll be good. And that's that's where we leave Moshe here. Okay, now we're gonna switch, go fast forward to chapter twenty of in Exodus. Okay, which is the Ten Commandments chapter. Um, oh, sorry, we're going to go back, not 20, 18. <laughs> the beginning of Parsha Yitro. And here he's called Yitro. Okay. And you see it's the same person because in verse one, which is page 432. So, in the first verse, it says Yitro, Jethro, priest of Midian, which is exactly the description we had before, like he was a priest of Midian, Moshe's father-in-law. Okay, so just a little background. We have fast forwarded. Moshe has gone back to Egypt. We've had all the 10 plagues. They have um, left Egypt. And now we are on the cusp of the 10 commandments, which is coming up in chapter 20 in this, in this Parsha. So um, here comes Yitro, priest of Midian, Moshe's father-in-law. And he heard all that God had done for Moses and for Israel, his people, how the Lord had brought Israel out from Egypt. So Yitro, Moshe's father-in-law, took Tzipora, Moshe's wife, after she had been sent home, 
because you know Egypt's not the best place for your wife and small children when mm -hmm. the plagues are happening. And her two sons, right now they have two kids. One is named Gershom, who we met before. Um, and the other was named Eliezer. And there's an explanation of their names. And they bring, and Yitra Moshe's father-in-law brought Moses' sons and wife him in the wilderness where he was encamped at the mountain of God. He sent word to Moses, I, your father-in-law, Yitro, am coming to you with your wife and, your, and her two sons. And Moshe went out to meet his father-in-law. He bowed low and kissed him, and each asked after the other's welfare, and they went into the tent. So we have a nice reunion. Great. They get along beautifully. They kiss each other. They catch up a little bit. Um, then Moshe, moving on, verse 8, Moshe then recounted to his father-in-law everything that the Lord had done to Pharaoh and to the Egyptians for Israel's sake. But he's telling him the whole story that happened, all the hardships that had befallen them on the way. In the beginning of Exodus, they have some issues. They don't have water. Then they have a problem with the food, and they have to get mana. Right? There's been ups and downs, and how the Lord had delivered them. And Yitra rejoiced over all the kindness that the Lord had shown Israel when he delivered them from the Egyptians. And Yitro said, blessed be the Lord, right? So then this great reunion and, and Yitro is, is very happy to hear everything that's going on. All right, we're gonna fast forward a little bit. Turn the page, please. Now we have verse 13. The next day, right after they have the reunion, they catch up, they have dinner. The next day, Moshe sat as magistrate among the people. While the people stood about Moses from morning until evening. When Moses' father-in-law saw how much he had to do for the people, he said, what is this thing that you're doing? To the people, why do you act alone while all the people stand about you from morning until evening? So here's the situation. Moshe is sitting. You can imagine it's in the morning. He sits, and then there's a huge line of people, you know, around the corner, whatever that is in the desert, where they're waiting to ask Moshe questions, right? Whatever the questions are, or they're having a disagreement, right? He's like the one and only person to settle everything. And Yitro sees this, and he says, that's crazy. What are you doing? Why are you acting all alone? And Moshe replied to his father-in-law. This is verse 15. Because the people come to me to inquire of God. When they have a dispute, it comes before me, and I decide between one person and another, and I make known the laws and teachings of God. And it seems like Moshe, just from, just this, like, he feels like this is the way to do it, right? What, like, he doesn't see any other way, it sounds like, than what he's doing. Then Moses' father-in-law said to him, the thing you are doing is not right. You will surely wear yourself out and the people as well. For the task is too heavy for you. You cannot do it alone. Now listen to me. I will give you counsel and God be with you. You represent the people before God. You bring the disputes before God and enjoin upon them the laws and the teachings and make known to them the way they are to go and the practices they are to follow. You should also seek out from among all the people capable men who fear God. Right? You have to get some help. Trustworthy men who spurn ill-gotten gain Set these over as chiefs of thousands, hundreds, fifties, and tens, and let them judge the people. Have them bring every major dispute to you, but then let, let them decide every minor dispute. Make it easier for yourself by letting them share the burden with you. If you do this, and God so commands you, you will be able to bear up, and all these people too will go home unwearied. And Moshe heeded his father-in-law and did just as he said. So, you know, he said, this is too much for you. You should not be doing everything alone. You need, you need help. So you'll be the top, like you'll be the Supreme Court. And then, but the lower, the lower decisions and the smaller disputes, let you know, you'll find good people and they'll help you and you'll have like a team. And he and he and he does it. Great. Okay, that's story two with his father-in-law. And now we have story three, which is in the book of numbers. So we're moving on. Amidbar, um, and that's in the heart of Oshawa. What? I think that's in the heart of Oshawa. Oh, yeah, I might be. Yeah, that's the moment. It's a different name. It's a different name. 825. Thank you. Okay. All right, we're going to move a little. It's kind of at the end. The end of chapter. Yeah, okay, so perfect, exactly, 825. All right, 825. All right, now we have, now remember, remember Yitro first was Ruel, then he's Yitro, now he's gonna be called Hoba. 
Right, Chovat Ben Ruel. Now that's a little bit weird. I actually just thought this today. And I'll just tell you uh, the commentaries say, because that seems weird, how can we be Ruel and then be Chovat, the son of Ruel? Uh, and Rashi, the medieval commentary, says that's because children sometimes call their grandparents by their like parents' names, such that they hear their parents calling their parents. It's not going to hunch and fit, and it's not really far. <laughs> but that's how they explain it. Well, even now, but some of my very religious world, it's like they couldn't understand why my grandchildren called me by my first name. It's not the thing to do. Mm. All right. Yes. Okay. So, but it's the same person. Okay. So now, because you keep, you know, it keeps describing him as the father of Moshe. That's how we know it's the same person. So Moshe, now, okay, now just the setting. We're in Bamidbar. We've already got the Ten Commandments. And now we're finally, even though it's two books of the Bible later, we are ready to move away from Har Sinai and Mount Sinai and go into the land of Israel. We're about to get going. In chapter 11, we're going to start going. And here we have Yitro, Chovav here, and Moshe says to him, we are setting out for the place of which the Lord had said, I will give it to you, right? We're setting out to go to Israel. Come with us and we will be generous with you for the Lord has promised to be generous to Israel. I will not go, right? So he said, what's he asking Yitro? Come with us, right? Come with us to Israel. And that, I will not go, he replied to him, but will return to my native land. And he said, meaning Moshe said to him, please do not leave us inasmuch as you know where we should camp in the wilderness and can be our guide. So if you come with us, we will extend to you the same bounty that the Lord grants us. And then you see there's like a little space because then, that's the end of this little story. And then they move on, right? So then they finally travel for three days. So one thing that we see about the story is we don't know the ending, right? It's a little, it's an exchange. Yitro say, Moshe saying, come with us. Yitro saying, no. Moshe says, no, come on, please come with us. It'll be good for you. And you can help us, right? You, you know, you can, you can be our guide. In Hebrew, it's like, you will be our eyes. That's how it literally means. And then... That's the end, right? We don't know if Yitro said yes or no. And of course, if you ask the commentary, some say yes, some say no, some say he came, some say he went home. Um, so, we don't, so we don't know the ending, but we know here that Moshe is saying, come come with us, please, right? Come with us. Um, so now let's, let's recap our Yitro stories. We have Yitro meeting Moshe for the first time when Moshe has fled to Midian and inviting him home and then giving his daughter to him to marry and kind of you know, giving him a, a little family. Then we have him, Yitro, joining up and telling, giving Moshe the advice about the judges, right? You can't be the only judge. You have to have lower judges under you or else it's too much or you can't do it alone. And now we have here Moshe and Yitro, Moshe saying, please come with us, please come with us. All right, and that's our Yitro story. So now we make a suggestion about Moshe. Moshe, I think we see, of course, there's more, many more Sukkim and verses about Moshe, but this is all we have about Yitro. But I think what we see about Moshe from these stories and how Yitro is helping him is that Moshe is a person who is kind of a loner. And, you know, and he's not a person, I think in our modern times, we might say, right, he's not a person who's good at, you know, delegating at all. He just wants to do it all himself. And that could stem from, you know, his upbringing where he didn't feel like he belonged anywhere. So he just was like, I like to be alone. And, and it takes him a long time, even though he's the leader of, of the Jews, of the nation of Israel. You, if you, you know, if you do a study on Moshe, you never feel like he fully feels like he's part of them. He's always kind of like a little bit of the other, the leader. And that's also normal a little because when you're always, when you're the leader and you're the top, it's a little, you know, lonely at the top. It is lonely for Moshe. And he, so when, when, he, when he's in the chapter, in the second interaction he has with Yitro, when Yitro comes and like, it doesn't even dawn on Moshe that I should, that I should include other people in my management, right? It's just me. And that's how I, that's how I roll. I, I do things myself. And Yitro is highlighting for him, that's not how you should be a good leader, right? You have to connect with your people. So you connect with having a team. Right, you connect like, you know, I mean, I'm a teacher, so I work at a school, right? So we, we connect, there's like the head of school and then there's the principals and administrators and then there's the teachers. And, you know, we're all kind of, you know, we're, we are, we're like one big team of, at the school. And he's like, you can't just be you. 
And then Moshe understands that because you see that he has a great relationship with Yitro. When Yitro comes, they hug and they kiss, and, and Yitro is one who, who has this power to kind of bring Moshe out of himself, out of him not being just Moshe. And that's why he, you know, we have this last part with Yitro, where I would suggest that we see that Moshe is saying to him, stay. But why is he saying stay? Well, he's saying stay, it's kind of a vague thing. Come stay, it'll be good for you, you'll help us. But I think you could suggest that Moshe is saying stay because like I need you because you're when you're around, like you you are able to navigate me to be a better leader, to be with, with the people, you know, to understand them. And if you're not going to be here, I'm afraid that I'm just going to kind of, you know, go back to the way I am, which is to just be alone, to micromanage, or you know, to not to not delegate anything. Now, if we say that Yitro went home, which some people say. It's interesting because now it's not for tonight, but the next thing that happens, if you if we're on page 827, if you're still on this mm -hmm. bar, in chapter 11, Nera, right? right away, not Nera, and that's a little bit after, but yeah, but right, right for the rest of Bamibar, there's just it's kind of like a downslide, right? The people start complaining. And you know, and Moshe, he, if you look in this in chapter 11, just this first episode. The people are complaining. We don't know what they're complaining about. The Torah does not tell us. The Lord heard and was incensed. God gets mad and a fire breaks out against the camp in the outskirts. And the people cry out to Moshe. What we see here is like God is the one who's hearing their complaining. Moshe doesn't even realize they're complaining because Moshe maybe has already gone back to kind of his, I'm kind of a loner, right? And, I, and you know, that that's how I am. So, that's so let's so now let's recap what we know what we said about Yitro. We have Yitro and Moshe, and we think Yitro is what we say, like as the title, a life coach for Moshe who brings Moshe out and reminds him over and over again that to be a good leader, you have to be part of your people, right? You have to feel like they're my people, and you can't just like withdraw from them and think you'll just manage, you know, like I'll manage them, but I won't really understand them and I won't be with them and I won't feel like I'm one of them. And that's what Yitro has done for Moshe. Okay, now we're going to go back from the beginning of Malkut Tzedek and Avra. Okay, so we have some literary meaning, you know, like things that we can connect Malkut Tzedek and Yitro. Okay, first of all, remember, what are they both? Their titles? I don't remember. King. What? King. One's a king. Right? Yitro's king. not a king, but also, remember, Malkut Tzedek is also a priest. A Kohen. Right, they're both priests. Right, they're both priests. Right. And we have that, we don't have that, you know, aside from the priests like who work in the in the temple, and right? we don't have a lot of priests floating around. So they're both, they're both priests, right? And they're both, they're both like kind of leaders of their so whatever, of whatever they are, right? The priest of Midian, um, he's the priest of you know, in the king of Shalem. And then we see that they both have an interaction with a leader, meaning you know, with Abraham and Moshe, respectively. And after that, the Avram and Moshe both have like a big thing that happens. With Moshe, remember in chapter 20, coming up is the Ten Commandments, right? So this is chapter 18 of Exodus, this interaction with Yitro. And then chapter 19, he's getting ready for the Ten Commandments. And chapter 20 is the Ten Commandments. With God, with um, Avram, now we're going to scoot back here. If you take a look at Genesis chapter 15. So after, remember, chapter 14 is the war of the four kings and the five kings, and this interaction with the king of stone and Abraham kind of spurning him. Right after that, we have some, this is page 82. Sometime later, the word of the Lord came to Abraham in a vision. And we have, we're not going to explore the whole chapter, but there's this, um, what we call in Hebrew, the brief Ben Habitarim, the covenant of the pieces where God will, you know, reiterate the promise of land and nationhood to Abraham and they do this thing where they cut up animals and it's kind of like a, a treaty between God and Abraham. It's a pretty big deal. So we see that in both stories, we have a priest coming to, you know, a main character, a leader. And then after that, there's some kind of big revelational experience with, with God. Um, so we have that in common. Now, when you have things in common in Torah stories, it makes you kind of 
want to compare the stories. What's interesting, and now we're going to do like the comparison, is that um, both of Abraham and Moshe, right, both leaders of a nation. But Moshe is an actual leader of the nation, right? There's a ton of people, and now he's their leader. Abraham is a leader of who at this point in time? His family. His family, right? He's not, there's no nation yet, but he is kind of the symbolic leader. Like when we talk about the origin of the Jewish nation, we will often say, right, we start with Abraham. So they're both these leaders of a nation, but one is kind of not yet. And with Moshe, it is already. Like here are the people, they're real and they're right in front of you. Um, and then what's very interesting, and this I think is the amazing connection that we see, but it's what we call like um, subversive, right? What is Abraham, if you look at Abraham's life, it is, it is focused really on the beginning and the end with both, which both start with the word lechlecha. So remember, okay, we're speaking that again. In chapter 12, which is when we first meet Abraham on page um, 69. A God, he starts out and God says, you have to leave, you have to separate from your family, right? Leave them behind because now you're going to be, right? You're going to be this leader in the future. Uh, you're going to get this land. And um, you, to do that, right, you need to separate out. You can separate out from, from your background, from your previous culture. You're going to separate out from all of that. The last story we have about Abraham is in chapter 22 of Rishi. I think it's 22. Yeah, in 22. Very famous story that I'm sure we all know. If you look at page 117, which is the Akedah, right? The binding of Isaac. And if you look at the language and the first, um, look in the second passage, we'll read the first two. God puts Abraham to a test. He says, Abraham, and the answer is, here I am. And he said, take your son, your favorite one, Yitzchak, who you love. And then it says, and go. Right, go, you're gonna now, you're gonna go and you're gonna go to this mountain of Moriah and you're gonna offer him up there as a burnt offering. So if you look at Abraham's life, <coughs> the stories that we kind of recount in the beginning, a lot of them are separating stories, right? In the beginning, Abraham is left from his family, from his homeland. Then he has to separate from his nephew Lot because there's this tension and Lot Right, Lot wants to be wealthy and he wants to focus on materialism. And that's not what Abraham needs to focus on. Abraham needs to focus on his mission, which is to be connected with God, to be spiritual. So he separates from Lot. Then he, you know, Yitzchak, before Yitzchak is born, he has um, a child with the maidservant Hagar, Ishmael, and he ends up separating from, from him. And then at the end of in the end story with Akeda Yitzhak, God is saying, now I mean, here's the test. You're gonna have to maybe separate even from Yitzhak who you love. So Abraham's life is filled with these like separations and distancing himself. Now, going back to the story we focused on tonight, the four kings and the five kings and Malki Tzedek, there's a suggestion which I think ties in beautifully that maybe Malki Tzedek, what is he maybe said he's there to show us like the bad stuff about the king of Sodom, And maybe he shows up on the scene to kind of help Abraham regain his footing. Because what, what might Abraham have done, right? Abraham's living by himself and trying to be all, let's say, spiritual and connected to Hashem. And then he gets drawn into this war, right? That's very not spiritual. And then he gets kind of like tempted, like, oh, have an alliance with the king of Sodom, and he will make you very wealthy, right? Remember, take, give me the people, but take the possessions. So you're Abraham, maybe you'll be like tempted. And then, you know, you'll kind of also move away from what your mission is of being, of being, you know, the, the, uh, the forerunner of the Jewish people who are going to be, you know, the light in the dark and be very moral and all of that. So what is Malki Tzedek? Malki Tzedek like shows up as this mysterious character to kind of remind Abraham, hey, Abraham, 
don't be with stone because what you should be is you should remember that the reason you won this war is because God protected you. And look, I am blessing you. And that's what it should be. It should be about giving. It should be about taking. And Abraham then is reminded of that. And maybe that gives him the strength to then say to the king of stone, you know what? I don't want any of your stuff, right? I don't want anything to do with you. So that's Abraham. Now we'll see there's the connection, the same thing, but the opposite with Moshe, right? If Abraham's challenge is to kind of stay separate so that he could start, right? Like, you know, like the spark of the Jewish nation is going to come from him. So he needs to kind of stay separate and not get immersed in the cultures around him. Then there's Moshe. Now Moshe wants to stay separate. He wants all the time, it seems from, you know, from his background to be alone and to be a loner and to just do things on his own. But Yitro is there to say, no, Moshe, your challenge is that you need to bring yourself in more. You need to connect more with your people, right? You need to immerse yourself more with them. And I'm here to be your inspiration for that, right? That's where he starts in Midian by bringing him into his own family. Then in uh, before the giving of the Torah, he reminds him about like, don't do it alone, right? You need help. You need to involve your people. And then at the end, Moshe recognized that and says, don't leave me because I need you to be, to be that person for me. Um, so it's fascinating because in both cases, then we have a priest, right? And also who is, who comes to be an inspiration to the leader, but the inspiration, you know, each person needs their own inspiration. Adam needs inspiration to stay separate and Moshe needs inspiration uh, to not stay separate, to be part of the Jews. So here we have, you know, connection when you read through the Chumash, all these stories, some more like last week we did Noah and Jonah. Right away we were like, oh yes, there's water and there's destruction. This one is not as um as evident, but I find it so fascinating because it's saying, like to me, I always think the Torah should be bringing us lessons for ourselves. And to me, this is a story telling both these stories are saying every person, you know, has their thing that they're always trying, like their own character traits. Sometimes maybe weaknesses, flaws, or just things that they need to like, you know, move outside their comfort zone. And each person has, you know, something different that um, that they need to kind of be the be their best selves. Um, and in this case, we see now uh, each of us needs to. I think that's what I think this lesson. He just needs to kind of have those people in our lives who help us with that, right? Who bring out that inspiration. Sometimes it's a friend. Sometimes it's a family member. Sometimes it's a therapist. You know, in this case, I like to call it, it was life coach because it went nicely with leaders, um, the catchy title. But we all need those people because we all, even our great leaders in the Kumash, Moshe and Abraham, right? They all had their challenges and they couldn't just overcome them on their own. And I think as us, like to me, that's a great lesson that I love from what well, I love is because it's not an, um, an obvious connection. Like you have to dig it a little bit, but I think it's just a lesson for all of us that we all have to recognize none of us, we all have things that we need to like kind of help with because we have a natural tendency, whatever it is for each of us to be one way. And then we have to find those people and recognize them that they can help us. And then, you know, we can like be a better person, be our best selves, step outside of our own comfort zones. And that's what I think we see from, from these two stories. And that's what I think we, you know, in my opinion, that's what we wish should, should, uh, should take from these stories, you know, into our own lives. All right. I talked a lot. I don't want to say anything. <laughs> say no man is an island, right? All right. Well, thank you uh, thank for you. coming. And I think that's uh, almost we have five minutes. But thank you all for coming and have a good night. So next week, I think we have no class, correct? Right? Because it is we have no class next week. No, because it's no. okay. And then the following two weeks, we'll have it's a four part series, so we'll have uh, two classes after that. Is that expression on no man is an island? Okay. Yeah, that's right. Like Moshe wants to be an island, and he, he should not be, and no one should be, I guess, is I think I think the lesson. All right, well, just want a good week and a good night. I think something